Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome, or hopefully welcome back, to another episode of the Reliability Matters podcast. The subject of this episode will be a little different than most other episodes. My guest today is Dave Hillman. Many of you know Dave from conferences and symposiums. Perhaps you've seen his webinars, read his papers, or even bumped into him at numerous trade shows. Dave is a fixture in the world of electronic assembly. Dave Hillman is a metallurgical engineer, and prior to his retirement, he worked at the Advanced Operations Engineering Department of Collins Aerospace in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Dave was a guest on this podcast back in January of 2021 on episode number 60, where we pontificated about voiding. Today, we're not going to cover voiding or any other metallurgical phenomenon. Instead, we're going to take a brain break and talk about something Dave is super passionate about, and that passion is kayaking. During the last Apex Expo in San Diego, I happened to be walking past one of the meeting rooms. The room was standing room only. I stopped and peeked through the door to see what speaker managed to pack the room. Of course, it was Dave Hillman. He was sharing his amazing 3,600-mile kayak journey down the Missouri River. I was scheduled to give a presentation in a few minutes in a much less packed room, so I couldn't stop and listen. So... I invited Dave onto the show to share his journey with us. Now, for those of you who are listening to the podcast, not watching it, but listening to the podcast, you're really going to miss out because Dave is going to share many, many photographs, wonderful, thrilling photographs of his journey down the Missouri River. So what I'm going to suggest you do is either use your imagination or better yet, watch the podcast on the Reliability Matters YouTube channel. If you're not familiar with it, just go to YouTube, search Reliability Matters, and you'll find us there. So without any further ado, I am thrilled and honored to welcome back Dave Hillman to the program. Hey, Mike. Hey, Dave. Good to see you on dry land. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, having a, a real bed and hot shower is kind of interesting. I'll bet. Well, you had plenty of water around you, most of it. Uh, fairly clean, right? I did, and we'll talk about that a little bit. It, yeah. it, uh, it's an interesting journey when you get to see from the top of the country to the bottom. I, I Yes, I can only imagine. Uh, and and I will not have to imagine much longer. We'll get to actually experience some <laughs> of your journey. But before we get there, um, how's retirement? Oh, my goodness. Uh, it's everything that people say it is. Um, I am 99.6% retired. I did a I'm doing what I call selective consulting. Few people, I, I like helping people just like you do. It's fun to go out and, and solve problems. So um, as Doug Pauls, our good friend would say, Dave, you can't step totally away from it. So I'm doing a few things here and there, but yeah, it, uh, as someone says, when retirement is so busy, you have to unretire. You're pretty cool on that. I'm working on that. Yeah. I, uh, I took a step back. I mean, I still own the company, you know, that, that I started 32 years ago. And, um, but I, you know, I've been doing it a long time. So my role has changed. My team is amazing. They <laughs> actually run the company better than I ever did. And, um, <laughs> and, and now I get to do, you know, this, this stuff, content creation and, and consulting yeah. and things like that. And, and I, so I'm not technically retired. I'm kind of like, like you, maybe, maybe not 99.6%, yeah. but, but <laughs> I do find myself just falling into that stereotype of, you're busier in retirement than you are. You almost have to go back to work so to take a rest, right? <laughs> exactly. You got to retire from retirement. I mean, and yeah, it's 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 you're doing the fun stuff, the 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 monotonous things that you didn't like to do. You don't have to pick any of those anymore. So I can I can relate to where you are very well. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the great thing about it is everything I choose to do is I want to do. It's fun, right? When you yeah, go to the office exactly. every day, I mean, you know, generally you. you you know, enjoy what you do, um, but not every 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 function is fun. So, um, <laughs> so I didn't. You know, I, you and I have known each other for several years in a in a professional capacity. So I didn't know much about your personal life, and I had no idea that you were into kayaking. And not just 
not just like kayaking. Uh, I think you're <laughs> a, an instructor. I, I, so tell me more about your kayaking passion. Where did it start? When did it start? You know, just fill, fill in those, those, uh, those details for me. Well, like all of us, most of our, our parents took us camping, at least you're in my generation. That was the thing to do when parents had their vacation two weeks in the summer. And then my parents were no different. We went to Wisconsin and Minnesota and, and fished and kayaked. And of course, dad had an old aluminum canoe. And he threw that canoe in and we canoed everywhere. And so um, I grew up canoeing and I spent one summer earning money. And I looked at my parents and I said, you know, I can buy a motorcycle or a kayak. And they recommended I buy a kayak. So I think the motorcycle scared them. And uh, went down to Iowa State University and joined the club down there and learned how to roll a kayak. And after that, it just, it took off. I've dragon boated for over 30 years, which is a very large war canoe. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that. Um, I am one of the instructors at the Iowa State Canoe and Kayak Club. Um, one of my buddies said, you know, you've been teaching for a while. You need to be certified. So. I'm a certified American Canoe Association whitewater kayak level four person. Um, I have gills. I just, if it has water and a paddle, I think one should go and do it and explore. So, I mean, I've been doing it now for, I consider 46 years as my paddling career. I started in high school racing the old aluminum canoes and I've done flat water racing otherwise. But yeah, something fun to do, get outside, and especially in retirement. I, I don't go to the gym in the morning. I go take the boat down on the local river and I go paddle for a while. Well, so this, this, what made you choose this particular journey? Is it in the kayaking world? Is that kind of the Mount Everest of, of, um, of journeys? It, it is. A lot of people are related to doing the Appalachian Trail or the Rocky Mountain Trail. It's basically the water equivalent. Um, if you, a lot of people do the Mississippi, and all of us grew up reading Tom Sawyer or, and in the Huck Finn series. And, you know, going down the river is kind of cool. And if you're a paddler, you kind of think, boy, that'd be neat. Uh, my only trick was I had never done more than two nights, a couple nights on the river. I've never done a long expedition type of paddle. I've done competitions and all the other stuff. But I thought, you know, once I retire, and that's the problem, you need a lot of time. You know, I took over four months. Um, but once you retire, it's like, okay. We better do this now or I'll probably talk myself out of it. So I said, let's go do it and, you know, go big or go home. And there were a couple times go home sounded really good during the trip. I, I just can only imagine. Uh, so how long did it take you? Well, I, I'm almost going to answer the question as I say it. I would imagine it's taken you your whole 40 plus years of kayaking experience to get ready for this trip. But when you decided you were going to do this trip, um, what was the preparation like? How long did it take you? Um, how did you get your, it, it, your mental state in order for this trip? Or did you? I don't know if the mental state ever kicked in until the trip, but it, it changed. I do know physically I thought I was in shape. I got in way better shape. You paddle eight hours a day, your body kind of responds. But uh, being an engineer, you know, I can't do anything on a whim. we got to have plan A, B, and C. So I took over a year. There is on Facebook the Mississippi River Paddlers Group called MORP. And there is, you know, I'm not the first one to do it. I think I'm the first island to do it. But there's lots of people who've done it. And I didn't do what we call the source to see. The source on the Missouri River is Bower Springs. And you've got to walk about 30 miles. And if you're truly going to do it, you drag your boat along. And I'm a little lazier than that. So I started the trip up in the headwaters of the Missouri River, which is where the Gallatin, Jefferson, and Madison Rivers come together. And that was June 4th at Three Forks, Montana. And then I went all the way to the Gulf, took um, 124 days, uh, a little over just four months. Um, I paddled just solo. Um, you know, when you got to argue with somebody, arguing with yourself was pretty easy. And yeah, uh, physically the trip um, was, a, was a push. I haven't been pushed like that. But like you, you said, mentally, you don't realize what kind of mental things you get into. And and the hardest part for me with the trip was actually when I got on the Mississippi from St. Louis to Memphis was rough. That uh, probably the closest I came to calling my son and saying, hey, bring the truck down, pick me up, I'm, I'm done. So, um, yeah, it is a, a mental. But, um, again, you, you look – I've been looking for that in paddling, and this was one of those passions. So 
And there you go. I think the coolest thing is being an engineer, my buddy Ross Wilcox and at Collins, I said, hey, can I give you all my GPS data? And he says, sure. So got done, the trip was 3,743 miles, took about 700 hours of paddling. And someone said, you need to calculate your strokes. And so I, I timed it a few times during the trip. I was taking about 50 strokes a minute. I have a racing pace because I used to race. And so I, I estimate I took 2 million strokes in those four months. Um, my, my back and shoulders would remind me of that on occasion. Um, average day in the river on the Missouri was about eight hours, a little less on the Mississippi. Average speed a little faster on the Missouri there, 5.5 miles versus 4.5. And then the distances, um, typical day on the Missouri is 23, typical day on the Mississippi 35. I did a couple 60 mile days and it sounds really impressive and the reality is I couldn't find a camping spot. I had to just keep <laughs> paddling down the river because I couldn't get off. So, um, but out of those 124 days, I also took what we call zero days where I just sat and I took 32 zero days. So basically I wasn't paddling more than one out of four um, because so your, there's so your much. Your four month trip was really three months of, of paddling. Three months right? of paddling and one month of laying around and, and just enjoying. But there's so much history and people and and weather gets in the way and uh, things you don't think about when you have a house and a bed around you. So, and I really hate camping. I hate camping. I, uh, I, now when I do my whitewater trips and I go out with my paddling pod, we always rent a cabin. So you've got a bed and a shower at the end of the day. And unfortunately those are few and far between on this trip. So I, I did enjoy the camping, but um, yeah, the joke is I hate camping. I saw a little um, tent uh, we'll see it as we get through the pictures, but I saw a little tent, and I think it was an REI branded tent. Um, and, and was that pretty much your, your home? Uh, that, that's the house. A two that's the person. House. Yeah, that's the house. It just, it, and it's mobile. It goes in a dry bag and you paddle along. And at the end of the day, you know, you give yourself enough time to set up the tent and end of the day. Um, there you can see uh, as we go down the river here during the, the podcast, there, you got to do a lot of self portage and there's river angels and river angels are people that do nothing. But I, when I started this trip, I had a list of phone numbers. I don't know these people, but I could call them up and they could get me around the big dams. If I needed supplies, anything, you can call a river angel and they help out. Uh, uh -huh. But most of the time I was doing self portage. You can see uh, all my gear on top of the boat and there's a lot of gear inside and two wheels and you crab along and you just walk, walk around, whatever you need to do. That's, that's amazing uh, because yeah, I guess there are obstacles along the way. There are things like lakes and lakes usually have dams and, and, uh, and, and you can't, you know, it's not like Niagara falls, you know, that, that woman in a barrel going over the falls, right? You gotta, you gotta, <laughs> well, first of all, lakes just, it just occurred to me, even if you weren't rowing or you know, paddling, I guess paddling. is the correct word. Yes. Um, you will still continue to go downstream with the river, right? Um, you won't do it in four months. You'll probably do it in four years, but, but you're, you will go very <laughs> slowly down the river because the river is constantly moving. And then it hits a lake where there is no like major current, uh, if any current in a lake, right? So that is a hundred percent Dave power there, right? Yeah. And the inner the part of it is, you know, from the U S we're really privileged. You can do the Mississippi source to see, or you can do the Missouri. And the Missouri is, of course, the Missouri River is way longer. Um, it's also very remote. So a lot of what I saw is the same scenes that Lewis and Clark saw. Uh, but the river has changed. We'll talk about that. They put in dams and the river's changed in that aspect. But yeah, that, and that's actually what kills most people on the trips. I don't mean literally. They What stops their trip is um, when you're in the river, and I'm a river paddler. I learned really quick. I hate lakes. Lakes are no fun. And some of these lakes are massive. Um, as you go through. Uh, so yeah, you, you've got to deal with your own power and what the wind does to those lakes. We'll talk about some of that, but you can see here, that's where I put in three forks. Um, and what's interesting is I tried this trip, no electronics. So I had my cell phone, but I was deemed I was just going to unplug. However, I did take uh, an iPod. So I had music at, at, at night when I sat in the camp. I didn't use it on the river. Because as a whitewater paddler, I like to hear what the river's telling me. And the river always talks to you and lakes talk to you. But someone said, don't make a 10-song playlist. 
Because if you do a 10 song playlist, you'll know every note of every song. So I had a thousand songs. There was rap and country and pop and you name it, uh, uh, orchestra, you name it, everything in it. And uh, of course, my good friend, and you know Doug Pauls, Doug sure. offered to take me up and drop me off, which was just amazing. And um, the radio stations in Montana might leave a little bit to be desired. So we had my playlist going. The last song we heard before I unplugged out of the car is the next picture. So if you pull the next slide up. Edmund Fitzgerald. Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. So every Gordon, time. Little Gordon Lightfoot I, there. Gordon Lightfoot. Unfortunately, we just lost Gordon. Yes. But, Every time things got dicey, if it got weird, Gordon would be in my head. And now for life, every time something happens on the river where it's exciting, I hear the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald playing quietly in the back of you my know, head. You like, know, that's like Amelia Earhart embarking on an aviation tour to set a record listening to songs about plane crashes. I don't know, Dave. It's a little, it's, it's a little well, counterintuitive. Odds, though? A thousand songs and that's the last That's the one. one. Yeah, but, I would you know? take that as an omen. I think that would have that would have uh, startled me a little bit. But um, I like Gordon. But it, so yeah, it is a, it's a great Mariner song for sure. Yep. So there's the, and there's what it looks like in the upper part of the Missouri. It is just mountains. Uh, it's really interesting to start in the mountains and finish in the swamps. And uh, just beautiful vistas, clean water, just, uh, yeah, it, you know, every bend is something new and wildlife. So um, that, that's where the journey started. And the, like you said, the river's moving pretty well up here. Um, it's got a pretty good current, so don't have to work. As you start down, the, the they split this thing into three pieces, the upper the lakes, and then um, the the uh, where the Corps of Engineers has gone and and kind of tried to tame the river. So Hauser Lake is one of the little ones up above, and this is uh, Salome Springs. Um, but again, I hate camping, so if I could find known county or U.S. or state parks and things, this had a little pit toilet, beautiful. You can see the sunset there. Um, and I had this to myself, and most of the times I had all of these to myself. So, um, yeah, if you want to really go out on this journey and kind of figure out where your brains are, uh, a lot of our vets, and I have several friends who have come back from the conflicts, and they need some time to de uh, kind of relax and, and get their and brain squared. Sure. And they use the river to do that. And, and uh, I think I did the same thing. It's just a good way to, after 40 years in the industry, let's go out and, and relax. This is a Hauser Dam, and this was interesting. Again, I'm a big fan of history, and I learned a lot of history before as I planned the year ahead, things I wanted to stop and see, and then history along the line. Uh, Hauser was the, con uh, was the provincial governor in Montana, and he and the company got together and built this dam that you see here. The, the lower left is the current dam, and the one on the right, of course, um, had a few problems there. It, at the time, was only one of three steel dams in the world. And he built into the bedrock on the sides, but he only sank footings into the gravel bed. And unfortunately, after a year, the, the river does what the river wants to, and it blew the dam out. What's really crazy is you can see the steel plates on the face of the blown out dam. Those are still in the river. They didn't go and fish everything out. So as you go the first mile below this dam, you are dodging big pieces of debris and things wow. that could really damage your boat. And so, but to get to see this, um, this is also the only dam I crossed. You know, usually you come up to a portage and there's a portage trail. This one, they let you portage across the dam. And I'm thinking in this age of 9-11, I'm going to walk across this big infrastructure and I'm walking with my little cart and all my boat. And the dam workers come up and say, would you like pictures? You want to see the inside of the dam? Just wow. wonderful people. They, they see through paddlers and they treat us like we're kings and queens and we get to see some really interesting parts but they filled me in on some of the history and i i did more and found this picture so getting to see that connection is cool uh this here is the best uh, of the of the 3700 miles this is where everyone should go this is called gates of the mountain and it's one place where the river cuts through thousand foot granite cliffs um that only there are no roads in here the only way in is by boat and uh, there's campsites and we'll show you one of those but I think what's interesting is I took that last year in 2022. If you go to the next picture, that was shot in 1990 or uh, uh, 1900. 
Wow. And if you look, if you toggle back and forth, you can kind of, the, the thing I look at is uh, off to the left center, you can see kind of a tree up near the cliffs. And if you look at my version, that tree is still there. That's amazing. So 200 That's... years, of course, the lake is back, you know, the dams have backed it up and it's no longer a river that Lewis and Clark saw. But you can see that bluff. And, and this was just, I just took the shot. I didn't realize I was setting where someone else was going to take a shot. That's amazing. That's a, as closest to a time machine as one can get. It's just freaky. It's just crazy. And and the gates of the mountain is just an amazing area. So it, uh, I'm going back up there with a less loaded boat, a little less gear, and, and spend two or three days just paddling in there. It's about three days to two to three days to get all the way through this. Um, this is also where the Man Gulch fire happened, where we lost our first fire jumping crew back in either the 50s or 60s. That's a hike off this river, and they have headstones where each of the firefighters mm -hmm. fell. Um, huge hiking, and uh, if you love nature, this is one place to, to get into and just uh, eat it up. It's it's great. Two two points on Lewis and Clark in there, but you can see there, that was a view across from my camp that night, 1,000 foot of gravel going straight up. The little green pump, though, is interesting because I, you know, one of the parts of this trip is understanding the water. And I carried uh, 20 liters of fresh water all the time. I had a filter, but you were always near municipal water or campground water. And I wasn't going to fill my bags up, and I saw this pump, and it looks like a pump out of the 40s. Yeah. And I got thirsty moving my gear from the river up to the campsite. So I pumped this up, took one drink, and promptly went to my campsite, dumped all my water out, and filled this up. This is the way water used to taste for the pioneers. I mean, it's in an aquifer that has no civilization around it. There is no chemicals in it, it and it was cold. You know, it's coming out of that cold aquifer. Uh, and again, amazing part of the journey you just stumble into. Ah, uh, yeah. And, you know, one of the worries you do these trips, some of, are you worried about bears? You're not really about bears. We'll talk about another thing later that's worried. But two things that had me worried on the wildlife, ticks because I was basically going to go from Rocky Mountain spotted fever ticks all the way down through <laughs> Texas star ticks. I don't like ticks. And so you know, the joke was stay out of the high grass because there's ticks in there or velociraptors, both. But uh, the <laughs> other was um, snakes. You know, there are a lot of rattlesnakes in the upper part of this um, journey. In fact, one guy last year uh, finished his journey because the year before he got bit by a rattlesnake hunting for firewood. And so I was privileged. I lived, I worked in San Diego for four years and did a lot of hiking. So I know how to hike around snake country, but I got lucky here. This is not a rattlesnake. It's a gopher snake, but I was portaging around a dam and almost stepped on him. I was just tired that day and was not paying attention. Luckily, he's just a big yellow gopher snake, um, posed for a lot of pictures and just kind of reminded me, you know, be careful where you put your yeah, feet. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> warning. That's, that's definitely a good PSA there. Oh, yeah. And this is, you know, as a whitewater paddler, I look at this. This is Great Falls, Montana. And, of course, in our industrial age, they put five dams in. There are five falls. This was the biggest one. Um, it's, it's buried underneath the dam water right now. But, uh, you know, we had an amazing series of falls, rival Niagara Falls by easily. And I, I just wonder what the tourist, you know, what would have, if we had not put the dams in what would we do around these? But this is a picture before they dammed it up. Um, as I paddled down the river, um, this was the one place where uh, clearly you wanted a river angel's help. The uh, city of Great Falls really doesn't want people portaging around the dams. And one of the last dams is a class four rapid. And on these trips, that boat probably weighed 300 pounds, me and all my gear. It's not like going out on your local lake. You, you gotta be careful to not hit stuff. So I called Jim and Phyllis, they're the River Angels, and they came with their pickup truck. And I, they portaged me all the way around Great Falls. Um, you know, I, I, I felt that was good. I didn't want to walk the 32 miles that you have to if you want to <laughs> right. do the portage. That's crazy. And they take you to here to Carter's Ferry. It's one of three working ferries left in Montana. They still ferry people across rivers. So um, you can see the portage sign. That's where Jim and Phyllis picked me up. Um, and I got really lucky. I had very good weather. The first three weeks, I got rained on a lot. But after that, of course, the last couple of years here in the Midwest, we've been in droughts. And so the river is a 12-year low. And I, like, I, I tried to plan that. Low water is easier to read. How do you dodge rocks and all the other obstacles? So um, 
I had a pretty, the path was pretty set. There was no uh, second guessing on where you're supposed to go. As everyone says, just go downstream. Right. That takes you to Fort Benton. I guess, you, don't need to, I guess you didn't need a GPS for this trip, right? Except, yeah. Took you know. my GPS as a safety factor to talk to my son, but you're right. You know, lots of people before me didn't have a GPS. Lewis and Clark clearly made it um, with a little bit of help, but they were going up and down the river. And that's what, you know, that's what you do even in modern times. Fort I would Benton imagine that this one, river, though, probably has, I'm guessing, it probably has branches that, that veer off it, right? You kind of, I guess... When I said you don't need a GPS, I was kind of being flippant because if you're on a river, the river, you know, the river goes one direction, right, at, at any given time. But it, but there are, I, I assume if you don't know the river very well, there you could get kind of sidetracked at least, right, where you could go down something. You can that, get very lost. There, yeah. at certain portions and areas of the river, it does braid, and that you know some of those braids. Um, take you to nowhere. So, and I had the GPS I could look at, but at low water, the braids were pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the upper part of the river is especially pretty straightforward. The lower, well, I'll show you a picture. There's some others. But Fort Benton, this is as high as the river boats could go. And the, the Missouri is famous for its river boats and, and that sort of thing. And this was their final stop. And this was, I camped in the city park, they had hot showers, you know, four weeks without hot showers. This was, this was heaven when I got here. Took a couple zero days, went to the museums, you know, <coughs> excuse me, pigged out in the restaurants, um, you know, resupplied at the grocery store. Yeah. But, you you know, felt you human again. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it felt really good. But th these are the views. Just you, you've got these huge bluffs, this part of the river where the river is cut down and through. Um, great camping. Um, yeah, there's my tent. We'll talk more about that tent. It withstood some things that you know, I... I got lucky I didn't quite plan on. As an engineer, you thought I'd done better, but, you know, it all worked out in the end. Um, and one of the things coming down the upper parts is the Missouri Breaks, and that is a national wild and scenic area, and you get to see scenes like this is hole in the wall. Um, this area is about 150 miles, beautiful scenery, tons and tons of hiking. They see about oh, six to 7,000 paddlers a year, um, one of the, it'd be the second place if someone said, where would you go on this trip? I'd go up here with an outfitter and, and have an outfitter, you know, pull your equipment together and just take a few days to go down here and do the hikes and, and see everything. It was a gorgeous area. There's one scene. If you go to the next one, that's the old core of a volcano, you know, and you just, you're seeing these real time, no one else around you, just you and you and your boat in the water. That's amazing. There's, There's the typical again. camp. Yeah, that's that is I'm getting down to the lakes, but that is a typical campsite. You'd pull over on the river since the river was low. You know, normally that would be underwater. In fact, right now it probably is with the spring uh, levels. But uh, yeah, you pull your your kayak up and you set up your tent and you cook supper. And in this particular case, I was making a beaver very unhappy. Um, apparently, I was sitting on his lunch counter because he would come up and slap his tail and 10 minutes later he'd do it again and 10 minutes later he'd do it again normally they leave but this beaver wanted to eat on all the young um, cottonwood trees here and uh, he just wouldn't leave and i wasn't going to leave i was done for the day so we finally formed a truce i went to sleep and i think he crawled up on the bank and had had lunch <laughs> that's great well here's the middle and this is the part that lewis and clark didn't get to see this is what they call the, the dammed and lake section. You've got to go through six ginormous lakes, uh, Fort Peck, Lake Sac, Lake Oahe, Lake Sharp, Lake Francis Case, and then Lewis and Clark. And then you get down to Sioux City, and it was um, probably half the trip. It's about 1,200 miles. Um, really interesting water, interesting people. But if you go to the next cell, this is where a lot of the history kicks in. The reason we have all those dams up there is in 1927, the Great Mississippi Flood happened. And you can think back then, we were all, as a civilization, on the river. This is where we were. This was our highway. Um, the, the water event must have been ginormous because there were no levees. There were no dams. There were nothing to change the river. It just flooded. And in our infinite wisdom, Congress told the Corps of Engineers, we never want to see a flood like this again. So go build dams up on the Missouri River. And, of course, we haven't had a flood then, since then except for 1999. And... 2008 and 2011 and 2019 we've we've learned the easy way dams don't stop floods yeah, but right. unfortunately back then that was our 
our engineering thinking that we could we could do something with the river. But it yeah. is the whole, it is a source of these dams, why they're there. Yeah, I think these rivers have been here for millions of years, um, cut through granite and, and other hard materials, and they are not going to, I mean, they see a dam and they're just like, really? They just, they just cut through, you know, uh, trillions of tons of, of rock. They, I don't think a dam is, uh, is in the long term really going to change the direction of a river, you know. <laughs> the, as, as we usually say in instruction, the river always wins. You the know, river always the river. wins eventually. So, we can, we can yeah. delay it a little bit, but it, eventually it gets its way going where it wants to so and this is um fort peck lake it's it's one of the bigger ones the, two, the first two are kind of huge um they started in 33 they finished in 40 it's the world's largest hydraulically filled dam and that's where they take sand and gravel liquefy it and then pump it into place and then pump all that water out and consolidate it um the interesting fact and i learned this the easy way i didn't know this before the trip probably a good thing this lake has more coastline than california <laughs> wow when they put the dam in and you see all the little arms coming off the lake yeah. some of those arms are four or five miles across and wow. i've done a little lake paddling i learned a lot about lake paddling because um the wing can come up at any time i use my gps to watch the weather but when you're crossing one of those arms you might be four miles from shore and so i wore a life jacket religiously every day You've got to take care of yourself. But yeah, you planned on trying to do traverses and, and different things to make sure you avoided the wind. Because if the wind came out of the south, the waves went from no waves to five and six feet tall. Yeah. So a beautiful lake. It's it's one of the U.S.'s um, uh, prime walleye lakes. I mean, uh, world-class walleye fishing up here. I uh, mm -hmm. got to meet a lot of the, the fishermen on that lake. Lake Sac is the next one, Lake Sacagawea. And uh, Garrison Dam is at the end. They built it and started in 47, finished in 54. It's the fifth largest earthen dam, 178 miles long. Um, the good thing about this is you don't have those arms. You can hug a shoreline and kind of shelter yourself. But as you can see, you're still cutting through and around and, and doing a whole lot of craziness to get down there. The, uh, again, I go back to the history. And one of the things on the upper part of Lake Sac before we got I got down to the lake itself, is the picture on the left is what the steamboat captains called deadheads. And those are old cottonwoods that are buried into the river. And all you see is the top. The picture on the right, that's how much is usually underwater. And, you know, I always wondered why, why did the steamboats, I mean, they hit a tree. What's the big deal? You hit a tree that big, it guts your whole boat. There's sure. over 300 steamboat wrecks on the Missouri. Um, huge history. Some are still being found. The Corps of Engineers found one last year. No one knew where, where it was. They're still trying to identify it. So you get to see some of that uh, history. They only, I, I, and I have such huge um, respect for those captains. You know, that, that river changes every year. The logs yeah. don't just stay in one place. Right. And they traverse the whole thing. So some of my campsites weren't pretty. <laughs> this is the worst one. As we say, Missouri mud is special. <laughs> um, I was up to my calves in this. I, this was the day I went past where the Yellowstone River and the Missouri have their confluence. And last year, if one remembers, the Yellowstone flooded, severe flooding, um, which was really good because I went from five miles per hour to almost eight miles per hour. And about five in the afternoon, I realized, well, that might be a good thing for making time. It's a bad thing for finding a dry campsite. All the campsites were underwater. Wow. So this was the worst one. I just had to pick it. It's the only time I took uh, drinking water and actually cleaned off because I was I looked like a pig that had been rolling out on the pig pen. But, uh, yeah, you know, it is it is what it is. This is out on Lake Sac itself. And if you look in the background, you can kind of see the weather was not going to be nice. And luckily, I, you talk to a lot of fishermen, you look at your GPS, you check your weather. Um, the one thing I didn't really research hard was my tent. Um, luckily, this tent um, withstands 50 mile an hour winds because about one in the morning, I woke up, my tent is flat and you have no protection. All the through paddlers talk about the storms they've been through. And I realized, well, I can try to hold the tent up, which as an engineer was going to be futile, or just go back to sleep and hope in the morning everything is somewhat okay. Woke up in the morning, I was fine. Um, you need a tent that withstands 50 mile an hour winds. This storm went on down to Iowa. 
And what was funny is my friends, um, when I did get on Facebook, did you did you hear about the storm that went through Iowa and spawned four tornadoes? <laughs> I said, yeah, I was in the middle of it. Yeah, 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 you experienced it. This is Lake Oahe, and this is the one that ends almost everyone's trips. This is the fourth largest reservoir in the U.S. It is 260 miles long. It is north and south. And the problem in June is our winds come out of the south and go north. So it's always a headwind. I was very fortunate. I think I had six days that I, I didn't paddle because of wind. And you learn very quickly, if you got a headwind, uh, one day I went, uh, I think, eight, I went 15 miles in eight hours. Okay, wow. that, you know, a normal day is 20 to 30. So you just, you, you learn that the river wins and you take your time, you stay in camp, um, you fix things, you read your books, you take a log, you listen to music. But this thing is huge. And a lot of people have been windbound. They're trapped out there for a week and they finally just call it quits. I had a month worth of food with me and my water would last nine days. So, and I had a filter, so I, I was prepared for it. But uh, what kind of food yeah, do you, you bring on here. a trip like this? You say that would last a month. What is it? A bunch of canned oh, stuff or like like uh, rations? Uh, I I ended up with the uh, the, the freeze dried bags where you just pour boiling water into them right. because it was really nice. I had a jet boil stove. You can boil water in two minutes, pour it into your you know, this bag food bag, zip it closed, and five minutes later you're eating. As it turned out, that cut down on my fuel consumption, and it made it quicker at night. And there was a couple of times I'd been eating a cold supper because the storms moved in if I wasn't able to do it that quick. I could have supper ready to go in about three minutes, and I, I used that several times on the storms I hit. Interesting. And Oahe is, th this was one of the fun things. This is another learning, uh, you know. Mother Nature gives you the test and then gives you the lesson afterwards. And so I got up one morning on the uh, coming down on Oahe at Sugarloaf, and I looked to the north and I saw a storm forming. And I thought, well, you know, that's going east. I don't have to worry about that. So I got on the river, and an hour later, this is what I where I was. If you click the picture, right there. So off to the left, so you can see the front of my boat, my, my bags on top, those are my shoes on, on the right. But the large dark thing to the left, that is the biggest cottonwood tree I could find because the storm did not go east, it went south. And so I spent 45 minutes with my arm around this cottonwood tree having the most wonderful conversation while the storm <laughs> lightning and everything else is going off and raining. And uh, that taught me very well. If the weather looks dicey, stay in camp. Yeah. Don't go out into the Right. Don't, don't put yourself at risk. So yeah, it was crazy. Just like a river, weather goes where weather goes, right? Yeah. It doesn't care what we think. Exactly. But as, as, as torturous as Oahe is, you have sunsets like this. Just gorgeous sunsets. And if you go to the next picture, you also have gorgeous moon rises. So as I came down to Oahe, it was it, it, the interesting is when you get to Oahe, now you're in the Dakotas. And you start to see the large plains. You see herd, you know, huge herds of cattle um, and horses. I saw herds of horses. And you can imagine what the Native Americans saw with a buffalo, mm. with these, you know, four or 500 head of cattle just free ranging. Um, beautiful country up there. Just wonderful uh, places to be. And yeah, you, you see, I, tux, I put some weird stuff in. This is going by Mo Bridge, um, South Dakota. And of course, it's a low water year, so you don't get out of your boat because the shoreline is 50 feet wide and full of that mud, wonderful Missouri mud. Mm -hmm. This was Pizza Hut. And man, I wanted to have pizza that day. Really bad. Oh, I lost 35 that's like a, pounds. That's like a mirage in the desert right there. Oh, it, it, the, that's the perfect analogy. Just Yeah, I I never, I, I wasn't starving, but I, I could have done better. I was eating 1,500 calories a day. But I was burning more than that. And so when I had the chance, but I lost 35 pounds. I started out at about wow. 235 and I went below 200. Several of the people looked at the pictures and looked at me, what's wrong with you? And I said, that's what happened. As my son would say, this is the greatest weight loss reduction program you could ever sign up for. But there's I, I, a lot, a high dropout rate. I'm shocked by 1,500 calories a day because, you know, the, the typical, you know, all, your, all of your nutrition panels assume an average 2,000 calories a day for someone that is just, you know, just maintaining. And you are in, in, you know, doing this extreme physical activity. So you think that you could do 6,000 calories a day and not lose weight and, and not gain weight, right? 
but that's crazy. And, and I could have, but you did. You had the optimum word there. You would think, and I didn't think. I thought fifteen hundred calories a day. I'm gonna. Hit, I can resupply. I can hit some stores, and uh, it just that that was the physical side. Eight hours of paddling a day, the calorie wow. burn, um, and I learned really quickly to up a little bit of the calorie because I wasn't eating breakfast the first three weeks. And your body tells you those things. Yeah. And, and I was bonking toward the end of the day. So I started to have a, a, a nice, decent breakfast, a simple lunch, and then a big supper. But yeah, I should have, uh, that was one of the lessons learned. I should have been doing 3,000 calories a day. Didn't yeah. hurt me. Um, but yeah, it's a heck of a way to lose weight. Well, that's one way, right? Yeah. Nutrisystem <laughs> or go with Dave on a, on a 3,600 mile <laughs> kayak trip. I wonder if I can market that. We'll have to see. So. Yeah, there you go. It's, it's, it's the you- kayak diet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to steal that from you. There you go. It's Once yours. you get below, go ahead. No, no, it's, it's yours. That's, you may have that. <laughs> Royalty free. There we go. So once you get below Oahe, you get those smaller lakes, and you can start, to, okay, this is nice. And, and Lake Sharp is, is just a smaller lake. You notice the down toward the end by the Crow Creek Reservation, they call that Big Bend. And that is one thing the Missouri River cannot cut through. And you can actually, it's a mile portage at that neck. You can put your boat on your wheels and go over. It's also a mile portage straight up and straight down. And I'm like, you know, I'm here to paddle. So Mm -hmm. I paddled around Big Bend. This was one of those, um, I I got really lucky. So I stayed with some river angels at Pier for a couple days because I had south winds at 35 miles per hour. And that was not a, a day to be on the river. However, the next day, the winds became a tailwind. I did 54 miles. Normally this lake takes three days. I did it in a day and a half because I had all that tailwind pushing me. Um, But I went around Big Bend. It's an interesting river structure to see out there um, as you paddle along. But normally, um, yeah, it's a lot longer. And it's interesting. That's part of the river that's actually going from uh, south to north, right? Yes. And and suddenly, whoa, what happened? And yeah, for having the tailwind, the, 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 up part of the of the horseshoe, I was actually into a headwind. I thought right. that ironic. I finally get my headwind, and now I got to paddle back in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This seemed weird, or tailwind, I should say. And this was my camp spot. Um, not a lot, not a lot of spots on Lake Sharp, but uh, again, uh, I, you have to be careful not to camp too near the shore. But that's all the sandbar I had. Sandbars are great. There's no mosquitoes. There's no there no bugs of any kind. So, um, real easy to to just set up camp and and spend the night. Uh, Lake Francis case, again, uh, getting shorter. Um, so they're still pretty big, but like you had mentioned earlier, a little more current influence. The lake doesn't you know, dominate what you're doing as the big lakes above. And if you go to the next picture, the problem with Francis case is um, got tree gardens. You know, the, the core when they flooded the lake didn't go take all the trees out. They left a lot of debris in there. And some through paddlers have been out here when the water is high and the waves are high and their boats literally get picked up and sat down on one of those stumps. Mm. And when that Mm. happens, you're done. It it, it destroys your boat. So I was very fortunate to go through, you know, literally I was paddling glass on uh, Francis case. I didn't have a lot of wind or anything else. Mm. Last one is Lewis and Clark. And I'm probably one of the few people that maybe thinks part of the, um, the, the, the 20 and 21 where we had the, the pandemic, the pandemic um, actually set me up really well. Um, the Mississippi River Paddlers, or MORP group, every five years does a rendezvous. They were supposed to do it in 2020. Well, with the pandemic, they delayed it to 2022, which meant I got to be part of it. And these are 60 people from all over the U.S. and in different parts of the globe that have done this trip and done far harder trips. And so I got to pick their minds. Um, for me, the hardest part of a trip was where I'm going to camp at night. So I had the next five days. They already had the camping sites reserved. It was a piece of cake. So I got to be part of MORP, and it was a lot of fun um, just being part of that crew and seeing those people and, and cha- exchanging stories with them. I meant to ask you, when you were on your journey, um, did you run an app that allowed people to see to follow your, your trek and see geographically where you were? I, I did. So I had an in, a Garmin inReach, and one of the things as a certified instructor, you need a river plan. And on this one, it was like, okay, who am I calling? So the the routine was in the morning. I, I had text as part of this GPS function. 
in addition to weather and mapping. And so I would text my son, I'm on the river, and I would text him when I'm off. And the joke was if he saw me sitting on one spot for more than four days and he had received any text, he would come get my gear. I said, not my body. He says, no, your body's not worth anything, Dad. Yeah, We're gonna go yeah. Gear. Can we sell the gear, so right? Exactly, make money on it. So I, I routinely did that. And people could follow my journey. Doug Paul's actually every three days would go post something on Facebook. So a lot of people were watching me go down the river and I had no clue that I had a following. Yeah, I followed some of Doug's postings. Um, so we were able to all kind of root for you. And uh... Well, he embellished it too. Remember the crazy walleyes, the crazed moose, and there were a lot of things chasing me. <laughs> in, in, in only a fashion Doug Pauls can pull off, yeah. Exactly. So that was a privilege to have him be my blogger because I'm not very good at, at sticking with that. This is Springfield, and this is where the Mort Group stopped. And you can see on the right, we had a little storm roll through. 70-mile-an-hour winds. That is not my tent. That was somebody else's tent. Um, several tents destroyed. But what was interesting was the, the, per, the people dynamic. I'm with 70 people who have been through these in far worse conditions. We're all standing on, under a shelter, and it's hailing sideways. And they're like, well, this will stop. Don't worry. It'll, it'll come to an end. We'll be fine. Um, I just need to see how people who have been through the storms like I had started to be through and how they dealt with it. But we had a few canoes destroyed, a few tents destroyed. It was mm. quite, quite the crazy weather. But everyone's like, eh, who cares? This is Lewis and Clark. And when we got to the end, I was a fourth grader. I was hugging trees. No more lakes. No Done more lakes. with lakes. Yeah. Back, back, to lakes. A, back to a current. Yes. Give me a river. I'm a river paddler. And then, you know, down to Sioux City, that was the, the rest of uh, that chunk of the river. Um, what was interesting is the history. If you go to the next cell, this is the North Alabama. It is a known steamboat wreck. They, well, after it wrecked, they salvaged it. All that's left is the, the, uh, the hull. But if you look at the top of that picture, the deadhead that the North Alabama impaled itself on is still there. And you can see how the boat killed itself. Um, and the water was low, and you can only see this at low water years. And so I got to see the whole wreck, took a lot of pictures of it. Very interesting history. Yeah, I find it interesting with rivers, uh, not, not anywhere near your experience. Uh, my daughter and son-in-law have a house on a uh, well, vacation house on the Colorado River. Um, and uh, just after, uh, Lake, just downstream from Lake Havasu. And as he was showing me the, the river, I, I'm a boater, right? Only... I don't paddle. Motor I, boat. I, I move with throttle, right? But um, <laughs> but um, um, he's he's giving me a tour, and he goes, "Okay, no, you gotta when, when you go around this bend, you have to stay way left. You know, you can't go anywhere near." The, and I'm like, "How come?" He goes, "Oh, because you know, there's rocks there." I'm like, "Where are the buoys?" <laughs> I'm used to lakes, right? Where, <laughs> where are the buoys to warn you? And he goes, "No, no, this is a river." He goes, "It's yeah. if you hit it, it's your fault. You just have to." So there's a tribal knowledge you know, requirement to navigate those rivers. And, and everyone there just seems to know. If I had taken my boat out and launched it there and not known, I, I would have, you know, grounded my boat for sure. But, oh, yeah. um, and, and I uh, tapped into that. Yeah, because yeah. it is, it's, like you said, it's, it's, it's local knowledge and the river changes every year. So, you know, someone said, well, draw a map. It's going to be good for this year. Right. Year. So, yeah, that local knowledge was huge. I took yeah. a, a lot of that. Yeah. Now, there is part of the river, the Channel Eye section, from Sioux City down to St. Louis. This is where the Corps thinks that they are controlling the river. Uh, I'll never do this section again. It 109 mm. miles of the most horrid, obscene water. And part of it is, unfortunately, being an Iowan, I've uh, got to own that, own that sword. But uh, both Iowa and Nebraska treat this river horribly. We drink out of this river. I, I, in fact, I've talked to some state officials since my trip back and I've written some things that we need to do better. Um, uh, yeah, there, there needs to be a compromise between the water quality and, and the agricultural needs. And I think there is, but as is you'll see, there- Fertilizers and pesticides and industrial waste uh, going into that water still? Just, just all, so, you know, and I assume most of it's permitted, but why are we dumping into the largest river system in the U.S. when people use it for drinking water? Here's one example. This is coming out of a gravel pit. You know, I assume it's just wastewater that, that's permitted, but why would we dump that into the river? I mean, no wonder the river is, is horrible. It's just, mm. um, you know, above here, the water is great. 
This is a fun thing I pulled out of, of, of my uh, research. The yellow is the Missouri River in 1879, and you can see it wiggles and winds and all the bends. The blue is 1954 after the Corps has tried to tame the river, <laughs> and and they're losing that battle every year. I was going to say, I to see. it's a little more straightforward organically than it is, you know, as after it was engineered. Yep, it, and the wildlife, of course, has changed, and, and they're trying to run barge traffic on the Missouri, and the Missouri has smaller barges than I'll show you on the Mississippi, but still, um, barge traffic's been going down. This was one way um, they tried. They, back in the 40s and 50s, they drove uh, pilings into the corners to try to stabilize these shorelines. There's 20 foot of pile underwater and 20 foot above, hmm. and they wrapped them with uh, cable at the top to try to keep this together. If you look at the next slide, however, the river doesn't care. Perfect picture. <laughs> river threw a tree at it and just broke them. So these have been falling down. The core now uses a lot of rock. But uh, hmm. what I saw in the Missouri was the core is still repairing damage from the 2011 and 2019 floods. The river went where it wanted to go. This was one of three resupply points. I was talking with Doug Pauls, texting him off my GPS, and he had said, I, I, you're interrupted, we're having sweet corn. And it dawned on me, I'm going to miss the entire sweet corn season in Iowa, which is a religion here in Iowa. But there is one uh, campground on the western shore uh, on Iowa for the Missouri called Wilson Island. And so Doug and my son decided to uh, save me. And they came over and spent a day, did a resupply. And you can see the feast. We had, they said, what do you want? And I said, fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, fresh anything, because all I'm eating is things out of bags. Um, that's my son on the lower left. And uh, yeah, beautiful resupply. We, several friends stopped in that day and, and caught me and we caught up, but uh, I took a couple zero days and relaxed. It was a, a wonderful way to, to re-energize. What a good friend, Doug. Oh yeah, Doug is awesome. You know, same, this is sunrise down at uh, Hill Island, down in, in the Missouri section. Uh, again, you just, these never get old and you had them every single day. And the next one, yes. So. There were a lot of weird stuff on this trip. In 3,700 miles, how many footballs did I see? Zero, not one. However, every single type of round ball you could find is there. And I suppose the wind, softballs, baseballs, soccer balls, basketballs, little kids geodesic play balls, a plastic bowling ball. I could fill your house with the number of round balls. And if I could clean them and sell them, I could probably pay for the trip. It was just the most ironic thing. I quit taking pictures after a while. Just there are balls everywhere. We That's just amazing. lose them. This is in New Haven. So this is one of those interesting interconnections. So if you remember, I talked about Jim and Phyllis up at Great Falls, Montana, and they portaged me around. Well, John Coulter was one of the privates in Lewis and Clark's um, expedition. And he was actually one of the more um, favored members because he was a great mountain man. He is one of the first uh, white men to see Yellowstone. And John Coulter um, was released from duty by Lewis and Clark um, and way back down the river. He and a friend went back upstream to do trapping. And the story goes that he was captured um, by the Blackfoot. And uh, they asked him, are you fast? And he said, no. So they stripped him down and said, you start running, we'll give you a head start and then we'll chase you down. He outran them. He hid under a beaver dam, walked 200 miles to Fort Smith. Um, the guy was an amazing mountain man, but he settled later in life in New Haven. And the folks in New Haven wanted to commemorate you know, their, their favorite son. They got a hold of Jim and Phyllis. Jim found this boulder up there where he, all this had happened. And this boulder came back down from uh, Great Falls, Montana to commemorate John Coulter's expeditions and, and mm -hmm. live up there. So, you know, I'm a thousand miles between points and I'm still seeing all my river friends. It was very interesting. Best picture he took. It rained on us at New Haven. Uh, actually, my buddy took that. I'm going to turn that into a puzzle at some point. That almost looks Photoshopped. It, it doesn't uh, look, it, it's so beautiful. It doesn't look real. Yeah, Tony's an amazing photographer, and he just had the, had a better lens than I did, and he he captured this. It was just wow. gorgeous. And there's the other weird thing: coolers without <laughs> lids. We don't seem to keep the lids, but we throw the coolers. 
I, I could have filled your house with coolers. I'd had to bought lids, sanitize them. Most of these coolers were not damaged. They were just out there on the wing dams, on the sandbars. I have no explanation why we lose coolers, but we fall do. Off, fall off the back of a boat, probably, right? But if they were full of beer, wouldn't someone go after them? I just, it was yeah, you're so right. weird. You're right. It's strange. It just, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the hardest part of the whole trip, it's 400 miles from uh, St. Louis to Memphis. The river's a mile wide. You're not interacting with people. The Mississippi, uh, I now I had, had made the Mississippi the confluence. Um, the Mississippi has taught people, to, the, the towns, to get off the river. Where on the Missouri, there was a lot of towns still on the river. So my interaction daily was was quite small. And I had four days of 100, and, 100 plus temperature, so it was quite hot, but wow. uh, I survived it. This is below Chain of Rocks at St. Louis. Normally there's water going through here. I had all the campsites on the planet. I had acres of sand, so wonderful campsites. I could do, have a fire any night I wanted. All the driftwood dried out on that, so it was, it was neat to see. And I've, I've been in the arch, I've been in the museum. I finally, the last piece, I got to see it from the water. So that was uh, uh, pretty emotional. It's like, hey, I, I made it this far. And, and my son had always, I had originally planned this trip, just do the Missouri, just take it down to St. Louis. That's 2,600 miles of the, the 37. And my son said, what's another thousand miles? Never listen to your adult children, never. <laughs> it, that, that, that other thousand miles was quite a bit. But yeah, I'll bet. He, Glad you talked me into it. It's because of these. These barges are huge. This is a four by seven. It's a pretty typical barge. Uh, again, I was at a twelve year low. About halfway of half my time on the Mississippi, I came. I broke camp one morning. Came off the sandbar. All the barges are parked, which is interesting to see a, this big a barge parked on the river in a non you know industrial facility. It was pulled up on sandbar, and I stayed away from them. But I was able to get up near a gas barge, and the crew was out. And I said, "What? Why is everyone parked?" And they said, there's a barge run aground on a sandbar down at Greenville. And I said, what's that mean? And he goes, you have the river to yourself for two days because it takes them a long time to get them unstuck. But uh, they tend to go to the outside of the bends. I went to the inside of the bend. Like a race car, they kind of slide around sure. turns because they don't have side jets. They can push and they can pull, but they can't pull sideways. And again, huge respect for these guys to, to move this big a, a vessel up and down and especially low water, it uh, it got pretty bad on them the last month in uh, September. Uh, another chunk of history: the only Missouri State Park on the river is here at Trail of Tears, and they have a museum, they have hot showers, they have water, they have electricity. So I stayed a day here and kind of uh, went and and saw the history and and uh, just took a day and relaxed and um, beautiful campground. Typical where I stayed when I'm on the Mississippi, up on a sandbar. That was sand left from the 2019 flood. It's about 50 foot off the river. Could watch the barges go by all day long. They have um, high beam lights, which pretty much are the intensity of the sun. And hmm. so at night, if they saw your tent, they would light you up. Um, it's like, okay, you know I'm here. And then they do it multiple times just to be funny, I think. So, I guess, what do you do when you're on the river, when you just go up and down the same journey, you know, for your whole career? That's the fun you get, right? That's right. That was their day. So, and of course, downriver, I only saw, you saw my first snake. This is my last snake. I saw three others. One was, I don't, two of them were just water snakes. One was going down the gullet of a blue heron. So I never identified him. But this one is a southern banded water snake. I asked my friends after I got off. Uh, my rule as a paddler is you look at the snakes and talk to them and leave them alone. Turns out he's not poisonous, but I had moved a log. Again, it wasn't being quite as safe as I should. And uh, there he was, and I put the log back and took his picture and put the log back and left him alone. So luckily, I only saw five snakes the whole time. Not bad. Natchez, it's one of the few towns on the river. And uh, Mark Twain, and so you come up the ramp, and at the top of Natchez under the hill is a bar. And above the bar is still the hotel, motel that Tom Sawyer stayed in. So I got to stay in his, or Tom Sawyer, Mark Twain. Mark Twain. Mark Twain's room. And I got to stay in it for two nights. They tell you when you make this reservation, the bar closes at two. Realize it's going to be noisy until bar closes. What they didn't tell you is on Tuesday they do karaoke. Really bad karaoke. <laughs> so that night I got to stay awake and listen to karaoke. Not exactly American Idol talent right there, no? 
Not close. Not close. <laughs> Uh, from Natchez, you got a choice, and this is where being part of the Morp Rendezvous was huge because I hadn't decided, do you go all the way down to the Gulf through New Orleans? And when you do that, you're hitting big ocean traffic. The levees are 20 feet tall. You know, you've lost a lot of the things you want to see on the river. The alternative is to go over to the Atchafalaya, and you do that through the old lock. And it's it also takes 150 miles off the, off the river, which is, I didn't mind losing distance at this point of my paddle. Um, but it's interesting because um, there's a history to that. And if you go to the next slide, this is what, uh, you know, five, 10,000 years ago, the Mississippi used to run where the Atchafalaya was. Morgan City is actually the old delta of where the Mississippi went as opposed to where it is today. And at some point in the Mississippi's history, the Red River and the Mississippi ran parallel. Mississippi does one of its meandering bends and it captures the red. And then the Atchafalaya was the water distributing out of that. The riverboat captains hated. They called this Turnbull's Bend. It took them three days to get around that bend because of distance and the water being coming in from the red. If you go to the next slide, well, Colonel Shreve of Shreveport said, well, that's easy. We'll just cut a, a dike through there. We'll put a channel in there or a canal. And unfortunately, this goes back to man messing with the river. When we did that, the Mississippi goes, oh, that's a lower gradient. Water flows downhill. I think I'll go downhill. And by the way, the Atchafalaya is right there. The Corps of Engineers figured out that if they didn't do something, by the mid-1950s, New Orleans would be dry. The river would have moved west, mm -hmm. gone down its old channel, and done that. So they put in what they call the control structures. And if you go to the next picture, um, uh, go one more. There's a control structure. Um, they thought this would hold the river up. <laughs> this was almost blown out in 2011. They came about two days from losing this entire structure. They are still repairing it. Um, the, the river does what it wants. And most people think it's not if, it's when. The river will come back up and flood and we'll lose this. But uh, you don't go through here. If you go to the next picture, I think. Yeah, so I went on the Atchafalaya. It is a, a smaller river. It's the largest wetland in the U.S. I was going to get to see some lovely things again. If you go to the next picture, yes. And there were my friends. I got to see alligators. Wow. Not on TV. And my boat is 17 feet long, and this guy was about 15 feet long. Uh, wow. I saw three this big. Um, the beauty is everyone's, aren't you worried about alligators? They associate man with being eaten. You watch okay. Swamp People on TV. And Swamp People is actually shot down here on the Atchafalaya. And the week before, alligator season had just ended. So anytime an alligator saw me, they, they scrambled. So These they don't want to be up. eaten or, or worn as shoes. They, they uh, exactly. were a predator Big today. Is rough. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and these guys would, once they saw me, go away. This was one of the camps on the Atchafalaya, second to the last night out. And I pulled in chased a couple five-footers off the sandbar. They were sunning themselves, hmm. set up camp, had supper, started walking around like I normally do. And, and, you know, looking at the sandbar, looking for fossils and arrowheads and things. And I found this next picture. Apparently, there was a larger alligator on the sandbar than five-footers. I wear a size 12 shoe. I think the alligator has a size wow. 13 shoe. So wow. it was, uh, yeah, you just... You know, when you get up next to real wildlife, I'd like to go to Africa and see some elephants and stuff. You realize yeah. just we're not the top of the food chain. We're just no. part of it. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Again, uh, Spanish moss, cypress trees. The Atchafalaya brought back that intimate river experience that I had up in Montana. Um, and again, as you said, Mike, now I'm looking at my map because my – the Atchafalaya Swamp, and there's a lot of wrong ways you can go. Mm. So I paid particular attention. Which brings us to Hog Bayou. One of the people I'd met said, you know, I could have, you noticed there on the right side of the picture, I could have gone straight right into the Gulf. But there is a um, six-mile detour that's called Hog Bayou. You go through a very intimate swamp, and uh, then I ended up at Burns Point. That was my takeout. And this ended up being really good for a couple reasons. I had This was my last day. I had a lot of wind out of the east, and that point there protected me from the waves that were being generated on the ocean. So when I came out onto the Gulf and then paddled up to Burns Point, I had a pretty easy paddle. I didn't have to deal with water conditions. 
However, this will be the, I think the, yeah, and here's, no, go ahead. And here's what it looked like. You know, maybe 20 feet wide. I had airboats go by me. I had a shrimping boat go by me. His dogs were barking at me. They wanted to come play. <laughs> um, beautiful scenery, alligators, hawks, uh, ivory build, um, or rosy build, ibises, just all the wildlife you could ever think, all in, in this last day on the paddle. And the next one is, yeah. So, you know, I had no clue. Apparently, Doug had generated quite the following for me by his post on Facebook. How many people are actually following me? And as Doug says, on this last day, most people had one monitor for work and the other one had my, my paddling up because every 10 minutes, my GPS would send out and update my map. And I looked at the map that day and I said, you know, I didn't take one shortcut the entire trip. And you notice in the middle, I could go straight or I can take that horseshoe. And I decided I am going to go straight. I, I'm just going to, hopefully the maps are right. My GPS has text function. And every time I get a text, it rings. When I got to that point and skipped the bend, you thought that I had a fire alarm on my shoulder. I think everybody that was watching me is typing, no, no, wrong way, wrong way, wrong way. And I'm thinking, Come on, people, 124 days, 3,000 miles, 3,700 miles, and you don't think I can navigate at this point? So it was, it, it was an interesting moment in the trip to realize. Uh, I, I've since learned there was two, 300 people following me down wow. this river. I had wow. no idea. None. It was just crazy. And you had asked earlier, you know, what's the trip? There's the physical and the mental. And the physical, I think everybody does something in their lives that – that where they, they take themselves to a limit and understand what that is. Mentally, not as much, and this trip was very mental. Um, I asked the people on the morph, you know, how to explain it, and you really can't. And this is a line out of my favorite movie that I think comes the closest to explaining what do you get out of these walking the Appalachian Trail or paddling the coast of California or going down the river? What does it do? And it really, you find yourself in ways you, you never thought of. So. Um, that, that's the best way I can explain that. And the last one is, should be victory picture. And you can see I'm just, I had to tie my shorts up because they fit when I left and they didn't when I finished. So I've seen two see poses boat. like that now. The first exact pose, Dave with his arms in the air was after your last lake. And, yep. uh, this was, uh, the, uh, Gulf of Mexico. Yep. My son met me down there at Burns point and, uh, uh, took the pictures because I was I I was at the end of my journey. Um, I, you can see my life jacket. I wore that literally every day. And toward the end, the, you're always wet and you're always sweaty. And my back was getting friction burns. And a couple mm -hmm. more weeks, there a couple of them were getting pretty bad. And so yeah, I I found my physical limits. Like okay, time to come off the river. Um, couldn't sleep the first night. There's all these car noises and. <laughs> strange civilization. I, you know, I hadn't right. heard anything for, for months. So it was, I forgot how to use the TV remote. I uh, forgot how to drive. Um, yeah, it was interesting to, to come back into civilization. We took about three weeks to go from Morgan City, Louisiana, back up to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Um, we s stopped in and saw at Vicksburg, the, uh, the Civil War Cemetery. We, we popped all those things I couldn't do because I was on the river. Uh, Natchez has beautiful history. Memphis has beautiful history. So we took three weeks and saw all that history. And then uh, New Haven and some of the little towns I'd gone through, we went back and visited my friends to, to let them know I'd survived and made the end. You talk about the, uh, the mental and the physical challenges. Uh, I would imagine, though, without sounding too metaphysical, um, that there was an <laughs> emotional, spiritual connection to this whole trip, too, right? It's got to affect you. Not just the accomplishment, not just the feeling of accomplishment, but the, the sights and the history and the people all along the way, right? That really has to impact someone. You know, it, it, again, that, that quote is close. Um, you know, I think we all believe we have patience, and especially at work. You're dealing with, with all sorts of craziness at work and, and issues that don't seem solvable. And we, over our lifetimes, kind of generate how do we deal with those. But I'll tell you, I have patience now. Um, there are several times when things broke. There is no Walmart 
just around the bend. You get out the duct tape, you get bailing wire, you, you figure out how to do it. At the end of the day, you know, um, that was one reason I unplugged because we are so plugged into our electronics. Um, to sit on a sandbar, to watch otters crawl out of the river and look at you like, why are you here? You don't look normal. <laughs> Um, just that serenity that, that of, of all the white noise around us in society and stuff. Um, I think that's why a lot of people after the pandemic tried to, you know, got into boating and camping and hiking to get back out because we are pack animals. We like to be in the wilderness. And this kind of trip does that. My friends who have done the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Trail, uh, the same kind of thing, except, you know, I don't like walking. So putting my butt in a boat and paddling was really simple. Yeah. Uh, I would be completely remiss, last question here, I would be completely remiss if I didn't try and at least make some kind of connection between reliability and your journey. So you've got an awful lot of experience, an entire career on building reliable products, right? Because the work your company did can't fail. So yeah, planes got to stay in the sky. They have to stay in the sky, right? They only have to come down when they're intended to come down. Uh, so <laughs> how has your metallurgical background, your, your experience with, with uh, Rockwell, uh, Collins Aerospace, um, and the, the, the uh, expertise you have in reliability, how did that kind of play into this trip? I mean, obviously, you expect your gear to be reliable, but just, just kind of make <laughs> that connection so, so that the subject today makes sense on this show. Oh yeah, and, a lot, and 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 you know, you you do what you do. We all do what we do because we're passionate about it. We love electronics. We love the people we work with, and so that that pours over into what we do outside of work. And it, being an engineer, um, it was easy to carve the river up. You know, look at the dangers, look at the path, plan for the day. Um, you know, as engineers, we have plan A, B, C, and sometimes we get down to Z. You know, uh, I would start out in the morning and the weather forecast says it's going to be 106. Okay, maybe we should stop paddling about 1 o'clock because that would be smart. And so just being an engineer and dealing technical, you, we tend to slice up the river. It, as it turns out, most whitewater kayakers and many sea kayakers have technical backgrounds. They're doctors, they're nurses, they're engineers, they're into IT because paddling is a puzzle and you, you work through that. The other would be my GPS. Um, a lot of people have trouble with their electronics and it's very important. I always had it on my shoulder. Um, that way, if I got separated from my boat, at least they were gonna find me. I don't care about my mm -hmm. gear. Um, but the Garmin talks to the Iridium satellite system. And I had to look on when am I gonna have the most satellites going over the top of me. Um, at Omaha, the Mississippi goes right by Offutt Air Force Base and um, part of the base and by the Omaha airport. The GPS stopped. Wasn't because my batteries were out. I looked at it, it was being jammed. So they are jamming, yeah, I, and I imagine they don't want stray GPS. Security, yeah. Yeah, or going across um, the airport and things like that, even though they got other measures to do that. There's also a nuclear reactor on the Nebraska side just above Omaha. My GPS got funny there. So knowing how, you know, radio frequency, which we call really freaky, works, um, and <laughs> how the electronics are built, yeah, it just, that that enhanced. So when my electronics started doing strange things, um, it wasn't, I, I understood maybe what was happening technically and what could be around me and, okay, how do you solve it? Um, unfortunately for Garmin, it's shut your unit down and start it up again. <laughs> you know, reboot, reboot your computer. Yes. When in doubt, well, reboot it. it. So yeah, those two aspects, you know, being engineers and passionate about how we tackle problems and then just the electronics piece of itself, because many people have done like you had said, you know, you're going on stream. It's pretty simple. Just point it south. But having electronics really and added to the journey and made it uh, safer, easier, yeah. more connected. Sure. But not easier in terms of the amount of physical energy, right? There was no, no. there was no aid there. That was all Dave paddling power. Someone has to move the boat from A to B, and I was the only guy in the seat. So, yeah, mm. that was uh, – uh, yeah, I have friends that have said, how did you paddle that far? And said, I'm still wondering some days. Um, you know, it's that mental thing. You get into a mode that you sure. – there was very much a routine. You know, break camp, paddle for four hours, have lunch, 
paddle for four hours, make camp, um, send the signals out. So you, like everyday life, you find those those routines that work and how you deal with the ups and downs. Because uh, as you you said, there were times, you know, boy, this is this is really tough. Do I want to be out? Was there a time when you really came close to saying, okay, this is, well, I've accomplished time, a lot. That's enough. It's, uh, I think I'll call it a day. Yeah, that Memphis, to, or St. Louis to Memphis. That was, in fact, there was one of the, again, I got stupid. It was one of the very hot days. I mm -hmm. set up camp and I got dizzy, uh, heat. So I sat down. I thought, oh, wait, let the system kind of do things. I stood up to get a drink of water and passed out. Landed on my camp chair. I woke up 10 seconds later. It was just right. realized what had happened, put on my life jacket, went and sat in the river, cooled down. But yeah, that was one of those days like, you know, you're out here by yourself. You better be careful and not. Yeah, uh, if if I could have got off the river, I might have done it that day. But I was in the middle of nowhere. So, yeah. Well, I'm I'm certainly glad um, you're still on this side of the dirt and uh, and that uh, you made that trip. It was certainly an inspiration for me to watch. I did pay uh, some attention to your journey along the way. And um, Thank you. I remember in one of. I think we were on a, uh, I was producing an SMTA virtual event and the subject of you came up and, and, and Doug, oh, it was our 100th anniversary show, our, our 100th uh, episode cool. show uh, for this podcast. And I think Doug chimed in with an update live because this was one of the few times we did it live. <laughs> so people were asking about that. They didn't care that it was my 100th episode. They're like, where's Dave? <laughs> 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 Where's Waldo, but in water terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I had no idea. And I think it's great that people, if people enjoyed watching that and, and got to connect, because I did, Doug, what I would talk about the history and some of that. Um, I think everyone should go out and do a piece of this. Uh, Gates of the Mountain is unbelievably gorgeous. Um, the Missouri Breaks, where you can go to an outfitter. They have all the gear. They take care of everything, and you just get to go and, and enjoy nature and the river itself. Mm. So there's lots of ways to do this. Um, you don't have to be a, a silly hillman and you know do four months of it. But I think everyone, you know, you're a motorboater. You go out on the lakes. You know that serenity of water and wave. Oh, yeah. And I think Definitely. everyone should do that. I think they're really. Uh, I think it's part of our being. To, we're we're connected to water in so many ways. Yeah, water's my happy place. Whether it's an ocean or a lake or a river. I just love being on the water. That to me is that's serenity right there. And water dissolves stress it, all the time. It, stress is soluble in water. Stress is polar. <laughs> <laughs> I can get into can work, the chemical in side of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> two two techie people talking about that stuff. Um, absolute last question. We're so out of time. And to, for my audience, um, I'm sure you found this so interesting. You haven't realized it's been it's been uh, well over an hour. Um, but what's the next big um, milestone journey. Doug wants, Doug wants me to do the, the five great lakes. And I said, no, I'm not doing the great lakes. You hate lakes. I, you hate you, know, you start New York and go all the way to, you know, all the way to superior. I'm, I'm not doing the great lakes. Um, so this year, because last year I literally skipped all my white water and all that. So I've got five white water trips this year. Nice. I've already been in, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, North Carolina, uh, Alabama, in Arkansas. So I've been to those. We've got a few more. We're going to Canada. So I'm catching up on some things I missed out on last year. There is a, Doug will shoot me for this, a very, 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 very small um, notion in my head. If I went up to Itasca at the headwaters of the Mississippi River and paddled the St. Louis, I will have done the whole watershed. Um, but that's a very different, because you go through locks, very civilized part of the river, hmm. which the Missouri appealed because of the opposite. It was yeah. uncivilized and wilderness. So, um, but yeah, now it's just uh, figure out how to use the TV remote, figure out how the car works. Um, you know, since I'm retired, I have a backyard that needs severe help. Um, so yeah, it's just uh, yeah, enjoy this retirement thing like you're doing. Do the things I want to do. Um, tell people sorry. I'm not interested in things that sound like work, and uh, just you know, have fun for the next few years. Well, that's great. Well, will you fix up your backyard? Watch out for snakes and, uh, and other creatures. <laughs> You've, you're experienced in that now. And Dave, thank you so much for um, for sharing your amazing journey. And I, I say that uh, as as uh, I think that's an accurate description. It was an amazing journey, an inspirational journey. Thanks for sharing it with me and my audience. 
Thank you for the invite. As you can tell, I love talking about it. I hope we inspire somebody else to do something similar. So thank you. Thanks, Dave. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to or watching the Reliability Matters podcast. Our episodes have been downloaded more than 35,000 times, and I remain ever grateful for your support and encouragement. Don't miss an episode. Listen and subscribe to the Reliability Matters podcast on your favorite podcast app or watch it on the Reliability Matters YouTube channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure and click the like, subscribe, and bell icons to be notified when new episodes are released. We release new episodes on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. A special thanks to Circuit Assembly Magazine's PCB Chat at PCBChat.com and Ascendo Reliability at Reliability.fm for syndicating the show. Thanks also for your questions and episode suggestions. Please keep them coming. I love to hear from you. Send comments and episode suggestions right over here to my email address. It's Mike at MikeConrad.com. Just remember, that's Conrad with a K. Once again, thanks for listening or watching. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and perhaps most importantly, keep doing it right. And I'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.